So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seventh session of the Atokem meeting. Uh, we will have three speakers in that session. And I remind you that you can, during the talk and after the talk, you can write your questions in the uh, write your question and answer uh, panel. And um, uh, I shall also remind you that uh, after uh, the session, there will be a session with each speaker where you can meet them. So now we'll introduce the first speaker. So the first talk is given by Johan Moitzen from Lund University. And he will talk about uh, opto-optical modulation of extreme ultraviolet light pulses. Please, Johan. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here. It's great to uh, be able to host, give this presentation, even though the circumstances are what they are. Of course, I would like to meet you all in person, but this is much better than not having anything. So let me share my screen so that I can start my presentation. Okay, I hope it, all works well, should get my laser pointer up. So the title of my talk is Opto-Optical Modulation of Coherent XUV Pulses. This is a technique that we've been working on and learned now for a, a couple of years. And the aim, aim of this is really to use atoms to control XUV light. You, most of you work with XUV light and you know that it's hard to find good optics for it. Uh, it's really hard to find good modulators for it. So we figure we could develop a technique where we actually use the atoms to control the light in a new way, similar to acoustic optical modulators, but we use light to, to control the atoms that then control the light. And we follow a few different routes, trying to obtain spatial control, try to get spectral control of the pulses. Uh, in the interest of this conference, we also need to aim for the, the temporal control. And it's a good way to synchronize pulses. Uh, the next talk we'll hear is about free electron lasers. They also work in the extreme ultraviolet light sometimes. And uh, the synchronization there is a challenge. Can we use this technique to control the pulses in a new way and synchronize visible light with XUV light, that would be a good thing. Why do we do this? Well, I thought I'd start with uh, one of those slides I have for my popular presentations. It's early in the morning and we could could all need to, to wake up a bit. So this this short video is taken with 1000 photos per, per second. And you could really see the, the water balloon popping and my, my daughter getting wet and I'm getting even wetter. Uh, so to follow this type of event, we only need something like a thousand photos per second. On a regular cell phone these days, you get perhaps 200, a bit more than 200 frames per second. You can do decent slow motion videos. However, if we want to go into the atoms, we need much faster time scales. I actually would talk about two methods to obtain this. Uh, it's all about extreme ultraviolet light and how to control it. But the two methods that I talk about is first, if we can measure and control the generation process. And then after that, once we've generated the light, I come back to how can we control this generated extreme ultraviolet light? Uh, can we use this opto optical modulator to do this? Since I'm the first speaker today, I start with this common slide of how to generate high order harmonic generation. And I have a small purpose with this. We do ionize, we accelerate, and we recombine. And all this, these three steps, usually you think about it, the, the electron flying around like a small ping pong ball. Uh, it's important here to realize that the electron that we ionize is really a 
part of the same wave packet that remains in the ground state. So it's the same electron. So all this emission, this photo emission is really an interference effect. This electron comes back as a wave and results in an oscillating dipole. This is what gives us the uh, XUV light. The interference between the, the remaining electron wave packet, the returning electron wave packet, these two interfere and create an oscillating dipole, which leads to photo emission. We can do this many ways. Dif depending on when we ionize, it comes back at different times. We have the short trajectory where the electron excursion time is just very short. We come up to the cutoff region where we get the maximum energy. And then we have the long trajectory where the electron spends a lot of time in the continuum before it comes back and it can accumulate a lot of phase. And I come back to this part here. I mean, of course, the electron can pass the ion and return again. So the first two trajectories we've struggled with now for many years, trying to understand and see them both. The third trajectory and fourth and so on was of course predicted already in 94 by Levenstein in his famous paper, but we have never really seen them. We've seen them in theory a lot, but in the experiment, they're hard to access. So the first experiment I show is, is just some evidence that the third trajectory is, is really there. And to do this, we need to understand the uh, macroscopic uh, event of what is, what is going on when we generate these harmonics. We need to look at the, the wave fronts. Uh, wave front is basically just where all the waves add up. Different waves at different spatial points add up in, in space. And I will draw these as, as lines. You may see that uh, I do teach a lot of basic optics, so I'm just explaining these wave fronts for my students. If we have a curvature, we have a divergent beam, we have a curved wave front, and this is basically then that the pulse uh, the beam will diverge. And the more the curvature uh, we have, the more divergent the beam will be. So for these harmonics that we generate, they have rather different wave fronts. We start by using a focus beam. It's approximately a Gaussian in the focus. Uh, the phase of the generated harmonics depends on this IR intensity and the distributions. It will also have something like this. For the short trajectory, with a rather small accumulated phase, this is not that much. The generated light will have a small curvature on the wave front, and it will be almost collimated in the forward direction. So it's easy to see, to see where this light will end up on the, on the screen or the detector later on downstream. For the long trajectory, this value is much larger. Now we will cover a much more curvature, much more of our beam, and we will get a strongly divergent beam. So we see that as the wave fronts are bent much more. Combining these two, we see that even for the same color, they will overlap at different points in space since they diverge differently. And from this, we can see the interference when they overlap. We will alter, alternate between constructive and destructive interference between the light coming out from generated by the long and the short trajectory, respectively. From this, we then can obtain a lot of information about how the generation process works, what is going on, what is the difference between the long and the short trajectory. And we can see our harmonics in the, in the far field. So this is a spectrum generated with a 170 femtosecond laser. So rather long pulses, we get nice narrow harmonics. On axis, we see mainly the short trajectory. Uh, up here, we start to see the cutoff where the long and the short trajectory have approximately the same divergence. For the low harmonics, the long trajectory 
has a lot more divergence than the short trajectory. We really see the difference between them. And we also see that it's not a filled uh, generation. It's really, we see rings and already in the one shot, we see some sort of interference pattern. The interference between the long and the short will only occur on axis. So we also need to understand what is going on out here. And to do this, we want to change the face of these pulses. And the way we control the face is by controlling the intensity of the driving field. When we change the intensity of the driving field, we will also change the face of the generated harmonics. We can do that in two ways. We can either attenuate the pulse. You see this, the red curve, we just re reduce the energy of the pulse. This means that we lose a lot of signal. So we found that a better way of doing it is to actually stretch the pulse. So here the yellow curve, we stretch the pulse by chirping it. We change the chirp of the pulse, making the pulse longer. That way we generate the harmonics over a longer time and we get a, a stronger signal for lower intensity than we would if we just lowered the intensity. Of course, we compare these two techniques and see that uh, for comparable intensities, we do get the same, same results. And normally, when we do this stretching, you could say that, okay, you add a phase to the IR, that phase will also go to the XUV. So to compensate for that, we do both positive and negative chirps in all the scans. So doing this, this is what it looks like. We start with long pulses, making them uh, shorter and shorter. Here they are transform limited and the signal is maximized. And then again, we go back to long pulses and the signal decreases. We can go back and forth and you see that the signal changes a lot. And you can see that these rings, there's actually some structure in there. And where, where does that come from and how can we explain it? In these scans, the long trajectory is always more divergent than the, the short trajectory. So on the screen, we really see the, most of what we see is a result of the long trajectory and the large divergence. And this ring pattern puzzled us for a while uh, because out here, there should only be the long trajectory. It turns out that to understand this was not so hard. I said that we had a Gaussian beam in the focus not just curvature of the wavefront will not just be a parabola, it will actually be a Gaussian. Up here, where we have a nice smooth curvature, the generated harmonics will go in all directions. Down here at the wings, we'll actually get something more like a focusing. And here they will interfere in the far field and some places we get constructive interference, some places we get destructive interference. So there is sort of a self-interference, a spatial interference in the long trajectory, resulting in these big, big rings. So this is interesting itself, trying to understand it. This, this is a way we later will add a phase to the generated XCV pulses as well. So there is a link between the two techniques. When we need now do this scans, we want to see the, the region where we have both long and short trajectory. Can we see any interference here? So in the middle, we have the short trajectory. Out here, we have the long trajectory. And doing a scan, taking a line out through one of the harmonics here, harmonic 23, we can see a pattern building up as a function of chirp, as a function of pulse duration. And that in itself is intensity. We need a small rescaling to go from pulse duration to intensity. We see that there is a pattern here, uh, an interference pattern, both in the long and the short trajectory. To understand where this comes from, we made a super simple theory, basically just Gaussian beams with the same frequency, but different wave fronts interfering in the far field. So here is our theoretical model that we look at on axis. We see a rapid modulation between the long and the short trajectory, light from the long and the short trajectory, and out at larger divergence angles, 
we see the self-interference in the uh, in the long trajectory light. If we compare this now to to our experiment, we can use this model to retrieve the alpha parameters. Not only do we get the spacing between the fringes, we also get the curvature of these fringes. So we get the relative phase between the long and the short trajectory from here, but also the absolute numbers. So we can really map out measuring the relative and absolute phase for the long and the short trajectory, looking at the signal on axis. We break this down a little bit. Um, why don't I get the next slide? There it is. The different parts. Here, we remove the self-interference in the simple model, trying to understand where everything comes from. So here we have a short trajectory on axis, a long trajectory with just a, ga not a Gaussian, but just a very divergent beam. And we see the on axis interference. Here we remove the short trajectory, but have a Gaussian beam for the long trajectory. And we see this uh, larger pattern, slow pattern that changes because of this self-interference between different parts, spatial parts of the, of the Gaussian beam. And putting these two together, we get something that resembles the experiment very, very well. Especially for low order harmonics. For low order harmonics, this is really clear to see. I mean, this is, this is not a very high harmonic. It's a few harmonics above the threshold. And here, the signal is strong. Here, this pattern is really clear. Now we can do the same for all different harmonics that we see, and we see how this pattern changes. We also see that it starts to be more complicated. There is still an on-axis uh, contribution, an off-axis contribution, but in between, something is going on. These, these lines are breaking up, and we can't really fit, uh, fit this, uh, these plots with just two trajectories. There is more, the two trajectories we had can only explain the interference on axis. The self-interference explains the off-axis contribution, but the breaking up of the off-axis contribution, it's not sufficient. So there we, what we did was we introduced a third source and had a fitting procedure run free and see where can we find what is the best fit for this third uh, parameter and we get a result looking like this. The blue here is the, the phases for the short trajectory or the alpha values, the red for the long trajectory, and these two, as I should, they merge up in the cutoff. And then we have a third contribution that is very close to the long trajectory to start with. But as we increase the frequency, as we look at higher and higher harmonics, this one needs to deviate more and more, and it goes to longer larger values for alpha and we attribute this to be the the third trajectory it behaves very much like the theory uh, predicts for the third for the third trajectory so we are uh, pretty confident that we see at least indications of the third trajectory we have results that we can't really explain without introducing it and what to do with it i don't know but it's, it's kind of fun to see it at least that said about the generation, we now move on to the main part of the talk. So we need a, a quick, quick break and uh, move on. I'll go through the basic of this technique. Some of you have heard me talking about this before. Some of you have never seen it before. So I think it's good with some repetition anyway. So I will talk about how it works and then some small applications on how can we use this phase modulation. I'll show one which way interferometry because it, it resembles the uh, self-interference of the long trajectory. It, it's very, very similar. And then I show how we can use the technique to probe nonlinear stark shift. The stark shift is usually a nice linear phase addition when we increase the intensity of a field. But in this case, some atoms might actually show a non-linearity in the stark shift and and the theory predicts it and we would like to measure it somehow but back to how the technique works 
we want to use atoms. This thing is in my head. We actually want to use atoms to control light. And the most simple way to do that is through absorption. When we send in light through an ensemble of atoms with some frequency here, a broadband frequency, a white light, we get the fingerprint. We see what atoms we had. We see a nice absorption light. So this uh, tells us what atoms we had, how many of them we had. So it, in, in, a, in a sense, we control the light by changing the frequency of the input light, output light. If we now, instead of a flashlight, go to a coherent light source, a laser with a very short pulse, we can have the same, same frequency, the same bandwidth. If we want some nice short laser pulse, it needs a rather broad bandwidth. And then we send it through the atoms. And here is what puzzled me to start with. This short laser pulse is only there for a very limited time. Still, in the frequency domain, we see very sharp absorption features. These short features correspond to very, very long times. So how does that work? Well, absorption really is emission of light by the atoms. So they absorb the light and re-emit but they re-emit the light out of phase. So this is, it's been called free induction decay uh, and was demonstrated in the 70s for, for visible light. Now we, now we move this onto the uh, XUV light. The way it works from a Feynman description is that we have the incoming electric field, we have our electron cloud. We will distort this creating a dipole. And this dipole will then ring and emit light for a long time after the excitation. If we're exactly unresonant, there will be a phase shift between the incoming light and the re-emitted light that is exactly pi. That means that these will cancel each other out and we get what we know as absorption. If we could somehow do something to this, can we control this phase? Can we add an extra pulse? because now we have time. Now we have time for quite some time to actually control the light and doing something so that the phase is changed. This was first seen by Christian Ott and uh, Thomas Pfeiffer in their publication in 2013. They could really see a, a phase shift by adding a, an extra pulse. So we took this a step further and tried to see, can we use this as a spatial control. Can we control the space, spatial component of the, uh, of the light? And to do that, we need to control the wavefront. We need to control the wavefront just like the wavefronts I explained before. There is a nice analogy to the phase control radar where you have a number of emitters that are emitting in phase. And if you want to redirect your radar, you don't rotate the whole station. You just change the phase of these. So to start with, if they're all emitting in phase, they will emit light in the forward direction. But by changing the phase, you can see that you can get them all to emit light in a different direction. So by controlling the phase of these emitters, we control the direction of the light. Now our emitters are these small atoms. We excite them and they all emit in phase. They emit in the same direction. Can we somehow change this phase? Can we add a control pulse? And we do that by adding a strong IR field that stark shifts the, the states while they are excited. And then that way we can control the direction. So the intensity profile of our IR pulse will decide in what direction uh, the light will go afterwards. So here is a lot of information on the same slide. We have our atoms, we have the incoming XUV light, we have the free induction decay, and in the far field, we have our spectrum and the spatial profile. They're wiggling a little bit. There is some motion. The divergence here is larger than the divergence coming in. So we could actually see small amounts of this emitted light outside the incoming light. Now we come with an IR pulse that is offset so that we have a nice linear 
phase variation across uh, the focus and that will redirect the light at some time sometime after the uh, original pulse we redirect the light and we see the light coming out in a different way the way we add the phase with the uh, ir pulse is through the stark shift so when we have the stark shift it's basically that we excite the states and with the ir pulse there we shift the states relative to each other and then they come back again the only thing happened is that they have accumulated a little bit more phase or less phase. And that way we can redirect in any direction we like. So the first experiment where we actually could see this, we could rather clearly see at rather short wavelengths, so 42, 43 nanometer, uh, we excite states in argon and we can redirect and we call this the free induction decay. Here we can see, depending on the time, we can measure the different states. We can measure the lifetime of the states. We can just move around relative each other and we can see, see things like, like this. We see that the states are slowly decaying on a rather, rather long, long time scales. So we have, with these states, we have plenty of time to redirect them. Can we use this for spatial shaping? Well, if we have a linear phase variation, the only result we will get is that it leads to redirection. However, if we have a nonlinear phase variation, we can start to shape the beam. We can defocus it or focus it how we like. Uh, this could be done either through a linear, nonlinear intensity profile. We change the intensity of our IR field, or if there is a nonlinear intensity dependent phase, if the stark shift depends nonlinearly on the intensity, it will reflect in the spatial profile of our, our redirected light. So first we do this, we take our atoms, they emit light in the forward direction, we add an IR beam and redirect it, and now we just focus it a little bit tighter. So this beam, now we focus tighter, and we see that the wavefront gets not linear, but this third order shape. And that means that the light, it is the derivative here that's important because then we look in the far field and the, the places here with the same derivative, they will overlap in the far field. However, they will have very, very different phase. These atoms might have accumulated many, many pi of phase more than these atoms, but they still overlap. So they will interfere in the far field. This is how we can do sort of classical which way interferometry experiment. We have a uh, tightly focused XEV pulse, uh, 50 microns. We have a slightly larger IR pulse, but not so large so that the intensity variation is linear, but it's really a nonlinear change. And we compare the phase variation across the XEV pulse and see how will this look in the far field. Uh, why did it disappear? So we will get interference and just counting the fringes, we will see how many, how much phase have we added. Uh, let's see if, if the movie works. Yes, so here we have the experiment in helium. And we see that when we increase the intensity, these, especially up here, shoot out, but they don't shoot out as a small controlled beam, but it's actually get a very long extended beam. And looking carefully, we can see that there is an interference pattern. We take a line out of this as a function of increasing intensity, and we see that these interference pattern really show up. So we, it means that, yes, we can redirect the beam a lot, but we can also start to see interference. We can see interference in this beam in the far field very similar to the self-interference of the long trajectory. Again, we made a very simple model of what this looks like and we can fit it quite straightforwardly. So here we see the experimental data here for similar parameters in the theory with just Gaussian, Gaussian beams with different phases and increasing the intensity. So this was a straightforward change uh, can we now 
move on and use this to measure something more interesting like the nonlinear stock shift in helium. In this case, we, we put an IR field that is so big that we get the linear variation. However, the stark shift in, uh, in helium in the 2p state is not supposed to be linear with intensity. It's actually predicted to go the opposite way and then turn around and come back. This means that we get a curvature on our wavefront, which means the focusing. So here we had to go to a little bit more theory. So we, we asked our collaborators at LSU, Ken Schaefer and Meta Garda and their, and their students to help us. So calculating the, the accumulated phase as a function of intensity for all these higher P states, they are almost all of them linear. However, the two P state, they also see in their calculation that it start to decrease, it turn around and come back up. Now, let's see if I can get this movie running no um why not okay i tell you what you should see this was supposed to be a movie uh and actually what it means that we have a variation of the uh, 2p that goes first down and then up means that we get redirection first in the opposite direction compared to all the other states and then in the same direction. It will actually split your beam in two. And when we, next slide, you see that in, we look at only the 2p, we see that the 2p, it start to go down and as the intensity increase it, it will also go up rather a little bit more up because we have more, more light in this region. And then they did extensive calculation, both TDSC coupled to the Maxwell equation to compare these two results. And we really see a nice agreement. Also in the theory, it starts to go down and then up. So we can really follow this change, at least show that the, the 2P state behave this way. It goes in two ways and it goes down first. One way to see it is to say, well, this is a sort of like a, simple beam splitter for the extreme ultraviolet light and it is it's also a probe for a nonlinear stark shifts but i think i'm uh, soon running out of time so with this i'd like to thank uh, the people in my group uh, emma simpson is the first author of the, the paper i showed samuel and uh, nevin and anna uh, and then the, the group at LSU, I only found a picture of three of them here at the same time, but Marie, Seth, Mette, and Ken, Ken Schaefer. And now this is a good advice for you. Now, when you sit in front of the computer all days in your Zoom meeting, get up and do some yoga in between. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Johan. Thank you for showing these very beautiful results. So now it's time for questions. So you can ask your questions in the live question and answer panel on the right of the screen. So please, is there any question for Johan? Should I stop sharing or that is done? No, that's done for the moment. That's done. So maybe I can start asking. Okay, there's a question from Pascal Salier. Um, yeah. Hello, Johan. Very nice quantum pass differences. Could the di differences observed between the experiments and your model be due to phase matching effects? Maybe. Um, yes, there will be some phase matching that we don't include. Uh, what we've done here is we, we took the, the simplest explanation that we could and it fitted beautifully. <laughs> so then we didn't, didn't go further. But yes, uh, looking more careful, face matching will definitely have an effect on these, these results as well. And also the, right now we don't see a difference between positive and negative chirps, which is promising because then most of what we see is the result of the intensity. But of course there should be a minor, minor effect also of the of this okay any other question 
uh, Johan, do, do you plan to, to combine this kind of experiment and what you can do by, you know, manipulating the, the, um, the sample itself, the gas itself, the properties of the gas, or even using, you know, solid or nanostructures to, to increase the possibilities to, to manipulate the light? Is it something that you're planning to do or it's too, it's far too complicated or? I mean, we are, we, are, we are trying to manipulate it a lot. Right now, we see it as a control mechanism for some special uh, special experiments. Adding phase, we, I mean, we would like to do uh, control the uh, superpositions in a way. That's what we are doing. Uh, we would like to understand how we control the superposition. Can we have several superpositions at the same time and control them differently? That would start to be interesting. Um, it, it is not a very efficient way, I should be honest right now. Uh, anyone could help me with getting it more efficient, that would be appreciated because uh, we, need, we need resonances. We need to be on resonances and it, it, that's the limiting right now. So right now for these experiments, I see it more as a method to control and investigate rather than really yeah, getting very large intensities. Okay, okay. Okay, there is no, yeah, there's a question from, from Danilo. Can you go into a bit more detail about the third trajectory? Okay. More detail. Oh, well, I mean, the third trajectory and the fourth trajectory, they need to pass the core. So the electron is out in the continuum, it will pass the core and then come back again. So there we get the first two more trajectories. Uh, they will have a slightly lower cutoff than the uh, than the first and second trajectory. I don't remember exactly, but it's actually substantially lower, two point something up. Uh, so that's why we don't see it up to the high high energies. Uh, then, of course, it could come back again and again and again. Uh, it, it, it's actually well described in this ninety four paper by Levenstein. It, it, it keep repeating itself. However, we haven't really been looking for it. We haven't really seen it in the experiment. In many of the TDSC calculations, the third trajectory is actually maybe the dominant uh, for low energies rather than the long trajectory. Th this, this really varies. Um, but I think there are other people that know more about that than I do. But the simple thing is that it will pass the core, it will accumulate more phase and will especially the phase variation as a function of energy is opposite to the long trajectory. So that's why we see them diverge. Just like the long and short trajectory have opposite phase variation, so they merge, then the long and the third trajectory will diverge. And there will be more, but this is what we see at the moment. Okay, any other question for Johan? Another question from Pascal Salier. Could you estimate the relative weight of the third trajectory with respect to the first and second one? Is it expected that it drops very quickly with time, ex with excursion time? Um, ooh, yeah, that's a good <laughs> question, Pascal. We can't see that from the experiment uh, right now. Right now, we've been looking at the patterns. We, the, we haven't, the relative weights, uh, we don't see. That would be in the contrast of the interference pattern rather than in where is the interference pattern. So we're only looking for where the patterns are. Um, but as I said, in theory, the third trajectory is actually rather strong. Uh, many of these calculations I've seen from Meta, they, they show up very, very strongly. Okay, we have to move on. Thanks a lot <clears throat> again, Johan, for the very beautiful talk. Thank you. And so now the next speaker is Giuseppe Sansone from Freiburg, and he will talk about Toscan metrology at free electron lasers. Hey, Giuseppe, please. Thank you very much, Frank. So I start sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. Yeah. Okay, so good morning. Thanks for the invitation, I mean, to this unusual but very interesting meeting. 
So um, I will talk about uh, Atosego metrology at Free Electro Laser, a work that we have been doing during the, the last years, um, in particular at Fermi. And let me start uh, thanking all um, the people involved in this in this work. Of course, I mean, we are running experiments at a large scale facility, so there are many groups involved, but I would like to thank in particular the, the very strong support of the Electra team the person from the low density matter end station led by Carlo Calegari and the machine physicists who have played them in a fundamental role in the experiments, Luca Giannesi and Enrico Allaria. Um, so uh, free electro laser, there's been a really uh, prolification of free electro lasers in the extreme ultraviolet, soft X-ray and hard X-ray uh, in the last two decades. Uh, the first free electro laser which came into operation in the extreme ultraviolet is FLASH. Then there have been interesting, very interesting experiments in the X-ray at LCLS. Um, and now there are several um, free electro laser operating worldwide in Japan. Uh, Swiss fell in China, of course, there are different projects in Korea. Um, my talk will be mostly focused on the performances of Fermi. This is the seeded free electro laser in Italy, in Trieste. Um, and I will show you how the seeding helps um, us in order to uh, achieve unique characteristics, unique pulse characteristics. Um, I will discuss about atosegon pulse generation at free electro laser. This is of course a hot topic which has been developed during the last years and in particular I would say in the last three years they've been really breakthrough. So, uh, and I would like to start with showing some of this breakthrough uh, obtained at the LCLS in the generation of uh, atosegon pulses in yard X-ray and in the soft X-ray in 2018 and just this year in 2020. Um, you have seen already these slides in the talk that John, was, John Marangos was giving yesterday. I would like only to point out uh, some characteristics of the free electro laser operating in Stanford, which are important in terms of metrology. So LCLS is a self-amplified, it's a free electro laser working on the self-amplified spontaneous emission uh, principle. And this means that the characteristics of the pulse are changing on a shot to shot basis. Um, so we cannot really talk about a C pulse duration, which is common to all pulses, but there is more a distribution of duration, an histogram of duration here, uh, and also an histogram of structures. For many shots, depending on the operation of the free electro laser, there is a single atosegon pulse, but they, in the same condition, one can get also a double structure. And of course, this has its important consequences regarding the temporal characterization of these pulses, because this must be done on a single shot basis. On a single shot basis, one needs to get the full information on the um, free electro laser pulse, and this has been achieved at LCLS, implementing the circular angular streaking. Uh, which, give, which gives the possibility to map into the angular direction here on this screen, the temporal structure of the atosegon pulse. And in this way, uh, our coll the colleagues at LCLS demonstrated just at the beginning of this year, the generation of isolated atosegon pulses in the soft X-ray. Um, at the same time, we are doing our work at Fermi, uh, which, is, which is operating on a very different principle because it's a operating on a um, seeded mode. In other words, um, the XUV light, it's not obtained as amplification of spontaneous emission, but there is a seeding laser in the UV at around 260 nanometers, which is creating a uh, modulation in the phase space of the electron bunch. And then in the ondulator, this modulation will be amplified. Uh, of course, this has advantages in terms of uh, stability of the characteristics of the free electro laser and tunability. And here you can see just some example of the, I would say, unique characteristics of Fermi in terms of photon energy tunability. By controlling the seed wavelength, one can control the photon energy of an XUV 
range with a very high precision on the order of few tens of milli electron volt. And also the pulse energy stability, it's rather good. I would say it's even better in the last mean times, but typically it's on the order of 5%. So this is really a ideal source for uh, investigating uh, non-linear, for example, resonance effect in the extreme ultraviolet region, because one can exploit at the same time the energy tunability and also the energy stability. For our experiment and for the generation of atosegon pulses, one of the most important characteristics is the possibility to create different harmonics um, using different ondulators. And we exploited already in 2016 this uh, capability um, generating two coherent harmonics. Uh, the, and having the possibility to change the relative phase between these two harmonics. Here you can see a sketch of the setup that was used of the, the way the free electron laser was used for that experiment. So the electron bunch was superimposed with the seed pulse in the UV. We had the modulator and dispersive section which are creating this modulation in the phase space. And then the first five ondulators at Fermi were tuned at the, what we call the fundamental frequency, that in this case was a XUV energy around 20 EV. Then the radiation and the electron bunch were delayed with respect to each other using a phase shifter. This is nothing else than a couple of magnets that can be used to delay with extremely precision the electron bunch on the order of few attoseconds. And in the last ondulators, we created the second harmonics of the fundamental radiation, so um, radiation around 40 EV. The important point is that because of the seeding process, these two harmonics are phase locked and we could demonstrate that they are phase locked by changing the relative phase operating on the phase shifter. And you can easily see here we have an omega to omega, so we are breaking uh, field, so we are breaking the symmetry between the upwards and the downwards direction and we can control in which direction photoelectrons from uh, noble gas atoms will be emitted. Um, we did the experiments in NEON using a velocity map imaging just by measuring the number of electrons emitted in the upwards direction minus the number of electrons emitted in the downwards direction. Um, we could see the oscillation of the asymmetry and this reflects also in the oscillation of the odd beta parameters. So this was done with two harmonics and of course uh, as soon as we did this experiment, it was quite natural to think about the possibility of synthesizing a more complex field composed by more harmonics, not necessarily an omega to omega. Uh, but then the question, uh, the next question, of course, how we can characterize the temporal structure of this uh, combo of harmonics. And now we are going, of course, very close to the uh, harmonic generation field with the atosegon pulse strain. If you have an harmonic comb in the temporal domain, this should correspond to an atosegon pulse strain. So, of course, what we tried initially to do is to see if the techniques which are already applied in our community since many years could be extended also for the temporal characterization of atosegon pulses at free electrolasers. Um, here, just to remind you, I mean, it's actually not necessary, uh, the way uh, atosegon and pulse strain are usually characterized uh, using a rabbit experiment measuring the sideband oscillation here with a radar weak uh, infrared pulse. Um, in the case of a typical titan sapphire laser system, we have generation of uh, other harmonics with an energy distance of only 3.1 eV when we add a synchronized infrared pulse, we just create one, one sideband between each couple of harmonics. And by measuring this oscillation, we can retrieve the relative phase and therefore the atosegon pulse structure. Now, extending this principle to a uh, free electrolaser, it's not straightforward. There are two main problems. I will say the most important one is this one, is desynchronization. Uh, because of course, um, in our tabletop setup, we have very good control between the delay between the atosegon pulse strain and the infrared pulse, but this is not the case at free electrolaser. Free electrolaser experiments are usually based on the combination of the free electrolaser pulse 
and an additional user laser, which is usually in the infrared, but even in the best case, uh, which can be reached at CDDFEL, there is a residual time jitter, which is on the order of few femtoseconds. So this is the value that was measured a few years ago at Fermi estimated. So plus minus three femtoseconds. Um, of course, this is for many pump probe experiments and excellent stability, but for our goal, it's um, quite a large delay jitter, which will completely wash out all the oscillation of the sideband. So this is one problem that we need to fix. The second one, it um, regards more the energy distance between the harmonics. Um, at Fermi, it's possible to generate even at other harmonics of the seed wavelength, but the seed wavelength is in the UV. So it's around 4.6 CV. Uh, and then the question is which laser or which is the best photon energy that one should use uh, for the uh, infrared or auxiliary laser in order to create the sidebands. Should we use a UV laser? Should we use an infrared laser? So this is also a kind of different point that one needs to address when one wants to extend the Rabi technique to uh, free electrolaser experiments. So and I will show you how we address these two problems in our experiment. So let's start with the first one, the synchronization. Um, and here, just to show you the principle that we have adopted, um, I just present some very simple simulation obtained in the case of um, sidebands created with a tabletop titan sapphire laser system, considering two different cases. In the first one, we have three harmonics, which are perfectly in phase. So 21st, 23rd, 25th. Um, and you can see here the sidebands oscillation, which are perfectly aligned. If we change the relative phase of one couple of harmonics, for example, the phase difference between the last two is pi, of course, what we see in our simulation is that the oscillation of the two sidebands are perfectly out of phase. Now we have to imagine that we cannot measure this at a free electrolaser because of the delay jitter. So all this oscillation will be completely washed out so if you will measure on a single shot basis, the side vents, this is what we will observe. Perfect noise, I would say. We cannot talk about delay now. It's better to discuss in terms of laser shot, but you can see from this data, apparently we cannot extract any information. The oscillation are completely lost. But actually this is um, not at the end, uh, critical problem because as soon as we can measure this trace, the physical information contained in this picture, it's exactly equivalent to the physical information contained in this one because what we can do is to perform a correlation analysis or a covariance analysis if you prefer. So what you can see here in the last plot on the right are as a function of the energy on the x and the y axis, the how the different parts of this photoelectron spectra are correlated to each other. So we have, of course, a symmetric plot here. On the main diagonal, we have the um, variation of the harmonics, but what is important here, the harmonics and of the sidebend, of course, but what is important here is how to look how one sidebend is correlated with the other one. And this is what you can see here in this black circle. So in this first case, when the free harmonics are in phase, the two sidements oscillate perfectly in phase. So it means there is a perfect correlation between the variation of the two sidements. And this reveals through a positive correlation here in this plot. On the other side, when we are in this condition, when the sidements are oscillating out of phase, we have a negative correlation between the oscillation between the sidebands. So the key point is here is that as long as we can measure on a single shot basis, the sidebands, we don't need to observe the oscillation in order to retrieve the relative phase between the harmonics. But what we can do is to correlate the side, one sideband with respect to the other. And from the 
estimation from the estimation of the degree of correlation, we can get information on the relative phase between the harmonics. Uh, actually, this is not um, a new principle, of course. Um, this is traced back, I would say, at least in the 80s, where correlation spectroscopy was first introduced uh, for investigating in the infrared uh, polymers by NODA, but also for free electrolaser, these techniques are not new. They've been, for example, used by Franziski and co-workers in order to investigate it, OJDK, a few years ago. Um, the second problem that we need to address and that was mentioning at the beginning is the energy difference between the harmonics. And so here you can see the scheme that we have used at Fermi in our experiments, or harmonic seven, eight, nine, and 10, of the fundamental um, frequency at 4.6 eV. Now, the most natural uh, choice will be to use a infrared laser to create the sidements. And this is actually what we have done, but we have to observe the following, that if we have just one infrared photon exchanged with the photoelectron packet, which is ionized by the harmonics, we cannot actually have an interference process because if we just consider single photon transition, we will reach this level, but only through a single path. So for example, this level can be reached only by absorption of the harmonic seven plus one IR photon. This is a, turns out to be a rather simple problem to solve because what we can do is simply to crank up the intensity of the infrared laser. So we up to roughly 10 to the 12th where we can have an exchange of at least two photons with the IR field. And now we can finally create a situation in which we can reach a single level by two different paths. For example, absorption of harmonic seven and one IR photon or absorption of the harmonic eight and the emission of two IR photons. And if we run our simulation, also in this case, we can clearly see that we have sideband oscillation uh, with the only difference that now we have two sidebands between two different harmonics. Of course, I should mention here, there is also a very important difference regarding how the simulation are done, but most importantly, how the experiment must be run because due to the different number of photons involved in the two paths, uh, we will not see any sideband oscillation if we would integrate over the entire solid angle, but we need to restrict the detection only to a certain direction or to a semi-volume. Um, we can run through the theory. Actually, this is only the, uh, the only theoretical slides I have. Um, using the strong field approximation, one can derive the expression for the two sidebands, sideband plus, sideband minus, created between two, the harmonics Q and Q plus one. The expression are very similar to what we have in the usual rabbit case. Uh, there are some, we have again here, the dependence on the phase difference. The two sidebands oscillate according to HFA perfectly out of phase. And for the experiments, actually what turned out to be very important is uh, to present and to analyze the data, not in terms of sidebands, but rather in terms of this quantity, which just represents the oscillating components of the sidebands. Just to give you a physical uh, feeling, the quantity here, it's exactly defined according to the asymmetry parameter, which is used in uh, several experiments where photoelectron angular distribution are measured. And this is a, turned out to be a very important um, way, I mean, very useful way to isolate only the oscillating components of the sidebands. Um, I will show you in the experimental data, this correlation plot where we plot these, the oscillation components uh, of the sideband between the harmonic Q and Q plus one together with the oscillating components of the sideband between two other sidebands. And it's very straightforward to demonstrate that in general, this correlation plots is represented by an ellipse. And the shape of the ellipse depends on this phase difference here, which is nothing else then the phase difference of the phase difference of the harmonics. So in other words, in terms of optics, this phase difference is proportional to the group delay dispersion of the free harmonics Q 
q minus one, q and q plus one. So just look into the correlation plots, we have immediately information on the group delay dispersion of the group of free harmonics. Uh, and here, just to give you some idea how they looks like, if the free harmonics are perfectly in phase, the correlation plots, we can easily imagine this is perfect, is given just by a perfect linear behavior. If the phase group, the phase difference is equal to pi, like in this case, this means that the harmonics, uh, the sidebands are oscillating out of phase and then there is a perfect uh, negative correlation. In general, the correlated plot will be given by an ellipse, like in this case. Okay, so now I can show the experimental data that we have acquired. So I will first show you the data with free harmonics. This is the configuration of Fermi that we have been using. So um, harmonic nine were generated in the first two undulators, then in the second two undulators, the harmonic eight, and in the final one, the harmonic seven. You can see here the energies. Uh, then the experimental setup looks very similar to the typical attosecond experimental setup using high order harmonic generation sources. So we have an infrared laser, which is collinearly recombined using drilled mirrors with XUV radiation. And the two pulses are then focused in the interaction region of a magnetic bottle electron spectrometer. Probably just important to mention here, we have this phase shifter between each undulators, particular between undulator two and three, between undulator four and five, and this can be used in order to change the relative phase between the harmonics, as I was showing you in the case of two harmonics. The first um, data that we have acquired here are as a function of the infrared intensity, because as I was already mentioning, uh, for these experiments, we do not, we cannot restrict ourselves to a single IR photon interaction. We need at least that the photoelectron wave packet is exchanging two IR photons. So we need to work at rather high IR intensities. Here you can see the typical time of flight spectrum with the free harmonics. Here you can already see some sidebands appearing. And this is the correlation plot. So as you can see here, when we consider the oscillating components of these two sidebands and we plot against the oscillating components of these other two sidebands, we cannot really see any particular structure here. Uh, but when we increase the intensity, of course, the sidebands contribution is going higher. We can see that a rather interesting and non-trivial correlation plot is starting. In particular, it's a donut shape in this case. And this is a was one of the first indication that we were really observing uh, the effects that we were aiming to, because this is something uh, that cannot simply be attributed to the residual fluctuation of the XUV parameters. Uh, the most convincing data, however, were acquired when we were changing then the phase of the harmonics operating on one of the phase shifter. So using this phase shifter, we can delay the electron bunch and so we can delay harmonic eight and harmonic seven. And of course, this is equivalent to anticipating harmonic nine with respect to the other two. So we can change the relative phase of the harmonic nine here. Uh, and these are the data that we have acquired. So this on the X axis, we have here the delay of the harmonic nine. Here we estimate the correlation coefficient of the distribution of the correlation plot. And you can see here that starting from this condition, we have a pretty linear behavior of the correlation plot. This means that the harmonics are quite well in phase and the correlation coefficient is therefore quite high. We change the delay, so it means we change the relative phase. You can see we have still positive correlation, but the distribution is no longer so thin. And if we increase now, the delay even more. We don't have any linear behavior anymore. This looks now much more closer to an ellipse. This means also that the correlation coefficient of the distribution is going down. And interestingly, when we change further the delay, we can also tilt 
the axis of the ellipse like expected in theory, it means that now we have a negative correlation between the harmonics and we can reach also the lowest correlation here uh, in the point F where the, um, there is a pi phase jump when we consider the group of the free harmonics. And of course we can repeat, we can also move on and of course the behavior repeats periodically. So we start climbing up again. We have a circle here, means correlation is almost zero. And then we can go back to our perfect positive correlation. Um, so these measurements clearly indicate that we can control the group delay dispersion of the harmonics. At the same time, this curve can be used as a calibration curve in order to associate to each delay of the phase shifter the corresponding group delay dispersion. And this is the information that we need in order to reconstruct the atosegon pulse stream. So, um, just some information about also the comparison with the theory. Of course, the comparison uh, between uh, experiments and theory, um, or better to say also the theory predicts an oscillating behavior of the group delay as a function of the um, an oscillating behavior of the correlation parameter as a function of the group delay. Uh, the only difference, and we took this into account in the reconstruction, is that between the SFA and the time dependent Schrodinger equation simulation that were done by Ken Schaefer in this group, there is a small offset on the order of nine degree that you can see here. Uh, uh, because in the SFA, we do not consider the continuum, continuum phase and also the uh, in general, we don't consider the atomic phase, which is added to the photoionization process, uh, but this needs to be considered when we reconstruct the atosegon pulse stream. So we use the curve measured experiment from the experiment and we just shifted off this small amount in order to get the correct calibration curve that was used in the reconstruction. Uh, and here I can show you finally the temporal reconstruction of the pulses. So the measurements of the harmonic intensity is of course not a problem. This can be done using the magnetic bottle without IR. From the correlation plot, we have information on the group delay so we can finally reconstruct the atosegon pulse strain. Here we have a very nice atosegon pulse strain close to the Fourier limit. When we change the group delay dispersion, for example, close to pi over two, the relative phase, we start seeing these satellites here and then when we have negative correlation between the phase of the harmonics, we can really scramble the atosegon pulse structure. Um, the interesting point is that with these measurements, we can also demonstrate a complete atosegon pulse shaping just on the phase of the harmonics. Here you can see that in the measurements, the amplitude of the free harmonics were very close to each other, but we just affect the phase. We can also do the other way around in the sense that we keep the phase constant, just not moving the phase shifter, but we can change the ondulator gap, so also the, or the compression of the electron bunch, and this leads to a variation of the intensity of the harmonics. So this corresponds to a full uh, amplitude shaping of the atosegon pulse strain. As you can see here, uh, we consider the condition where we have very, um, the best condition for the atosegon temporal structure. We are very close to the perfect um, positive linear behavior. So we have always a nice atosegon temporal, atosegon pulse strain, but the maximum height will of course depends on the height of the harmonics, on the intensity of the single harmonics. Um, we have performed experiments in uh, our bin times also with four harmonics. Of course, with four harmonics, uh, the situation gets more complicated. For these experiments here, each harmonics was generated by single ondulators. And again, we can use the phase shifter between the ondulators in order to change the relative phase between the harmonics. Of course, now we have three, we have two different groups of free harmonics. And so that's why I will show you, I will show you here two different correlation plots. So the correlation plots of the oscillating components between harmonic seven and eight, 
and the, uh, the oscillating components between harmonic eight and nine. And then of course the corresponding plot for harmonic eight and nine and nine and 10. And yeah, we can really play with the phases. We can really sh finally shape the uh, temporal structure of the autosegon pulse strain. Uh, just to give you an idea, we can go from a condition where we have a well-defined autosegon pulse strain, positive correlation in both cases. We have a short autosegon pulse strain. Then we can leave unchanged the phase of these free harmonics and just operate on the phase of the harmonic seven and create a situation where the group delay dispersion here is close to the condition to which the phase difference is close to pi over two. So we have a lower maximum intensity here and the satellite starts to appear. We can also have this condition in which the first free harmonics present a phase difference of close to pi. The last free harmonics again, a phase difference close to pi. And what we will get here is a nice autosegon pulse structure characterized by double structure. So you can see the periodicity here and within each period, we have a double autosegon pulse. And of course, all possible intermediate configuration are also possible. Again, here, the point is just to measure the phase, the correlation coefficient is a function of one of the phases in order to get the calibration curves and then uh, each phase can be simply set on the phase shifter. Um, and just as a last point uh, for, for the talk, um, the same uh, experiment can be used also in, as an autosegon timing tool. Um, for example, I just considered this case, which is also the most intuitive one. Uh, when we have the correlation plot close to a circle, the relative phase between the autosegon pulse strain and the infrared is simply mapped in the angular position here, according to this simple formula. So just by measuring the position of the correlation plot of the sidebands oscillating components, we get information on the relative phase between the autosegon pulse strain and the infrared pulse. And to convince ourselves that this is actually a good, I mean, autosegon tool, which can be used also for future experiments, which require um, autosegon resolution, we have reordered the side bands intensity as a function of the angle, according to this equation. And what you can see here is that we can nicely retrieve the side band oscillation as expected from theory. So it works and also we can also, once we have information on the sideband oscillation, we can also reconstruct the autosegon pulse strain using the typical uh, rise between can measure the shifts between the oscillation and we can reconstruct the autosegon pulse strain. And here you can see the comparison between the two different reconstruction methods using the correlation coefficient that we have been using in the, um, that I've been showing in the presentation and also the typical rabbit procedure measuring the shifts. And so there is also a nice agreement on this. So the same technique again can be used as an autosegon timing tool for future experiments. So and this brings me uh, to the conclusion. So I've shown you how uh, it's possible to characterize the harmonic phase difference at the free electron laser at seated uh, using uh, a modified version of the rabbit in which we don't have um, only two uh, photon transition, but we need to consider also three photon transition, a two IR plus one XUV. The key point is that we can overcome the lack of synchronization using a correlation analysis. And using this correlation analysis, I think in the future will be possible to repeat all experiments that we are doing in our autosegon communities, also at free electrolaser, without the need to have a synchronized, a perfectly synchronized infrared laser. The advantages of a free electrolaser are, of course, um, tunability and high energy. For the measurement I will show you, the typical energy was on the order of 10 microjoules. This gives the possibility also to investigate nonlinear effects with the important advantage that we have also 
complete capability on shaping the attosegon temporal structure. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Giuseppe, for showing these very exciting results. So now you can, we can discuss, um, you can ask questions to Giuseppe in the live question and answer panel. Is there any question for, the, for Giuseppe? Yes, good question from Maria Novella. Um, hello, Giuseppe, great talk. Now that you have this super fancy tool, how are you going to use it next? How are you going to use it next? I mean, we have a few ideas. One that what we could try, um, I mean, it depends if you want to look in the temporal domain or in the spectral domain. One possibility, for example, would be to do autosegon time delays experiments, the typical one, but now with the possibility to finally tune the photon energy. So to really address resonances in atoms or in molecules. This could be a big advantage, I think, of using this tool. The other things that we are considering, we have to, I mean, to have a look with the intensity that we can reach. It, to repeat, for example, some of the experiments that have been done in Midorikawa's group, where they have been looking to nonlinear photoionization of simple molecules, for example, N2, CO2, uh, O2, but now with the possibility to, again, tune the photon energy, but also to change the relative phase of the harmonics. So really to perform a kind of coherent control experiments in molecular photoionization. So this, I would say, are the most direct uh, direction that we could take. There are also, I mean, strictly related to these experiments that we have done, uh, some, I mean, also subtle uh, things I was not discussing. For example, this pi phase difference between consecutive sidebands. This is something that we can clearly observe in the strong field approximation but this is actually not perfectly true when we look to the TDSE. So we might think there might be, we might get information about the continuum continuum phase from these measurements. Yeah. So these are, I mean, the, the main direction, I mean, that we are considering at the moment on how to apply these pulses. Okay, we have another question mm -hmm. from Marius Lishman. So now you have nice, relatively intense and controlled at a second pulse train. Mm -hmm. Did you consider to isolate or generate somehow single at a second pulses? It would be nice. <laughs> I think, I mean, it would be possible. Or oh, at least, I mean, isolated, I don't know. I think it would be possible for sure to shorten the at second pulse train. Uh, what I see at the moment, uh, is the next step that should be done at the facility is to use a shorter seed. I think the seed now it's the duration of the seed that's on the order of 50 femtoseconds. I think the next step and we are also pushing I mean the colleagues at Fermi in this direction is to use a shorter seed because this will give immediately I would say one could rather easily get into a regime where one has only a few attosegon pulses in the train. Because for the moment, the pulses are like 300 attoseconds or something like this. No, the, the, pul the single harmonics is around 50 femtoseconds. Yeah, but the, the, in the train? The, ah, sorry, the, the yeah. single pulse in yes. the order of 200 attoseconds. Yeah, okay, yeah. 200, yeah. Yeah. Another question from Pascal. You showed two ways to reconstruct the atosegon pulse train. Which one is the most precise? Uh, for the moment, we are using uh, for our, I mean, I was showing the, the classical rabbit, let's say, at the very end, and then this based on the correlation coefficient. Um, for the moment, we are only using, uh, for all cases, the correlation coefficients. Uh, my goal in the next 
let's say months is to really show that from the correlation maps we can get the full temporal information uh, for a general, I mean, not a second waveform. This has not been done yet, but I think the inf we, we need to find a way to extract the information from these two dimensional maps. But I think, I mean, I'm pretty confident that this is doable. Okay. So we, we have to move on to the next speaker. Thanks, thanks again, Joseph, yeah, for the very nice talk. So the next speaker is Nina Ranger from Hamburg, and she's going to talk about stimulated X-ray emission and inelastic X-ray scattering at x -Fels. Please, Nina. Good morning. Um, thanks um, for joining um, the, the session in such a um, big um, quantity <laughs> of listeners. Um, I actually um, decided to change um, the subject of my talk um, when I submitted the abstract back in, in March. I mean, it's half a year ago and um, very exciting things happened uh, within my group. So I decided to talk today about X-ray optical frequency mixing. and. Um, I would um, um, basically ask the question if, if this might be a novel um, chemically sen sensitive um, probe technique and if it actually works. And um, this um, work um, is driven by, um, on the theory side, by um, Dietrich Krebs and um, from the ex experimental side, um, Christina Böhmer is um, the person that um, is um, yeah, running the experiments. So, um, X-ray optical wave mixing um, was actually theoretically suggested um, in 1969 as a, as a, a potential probe technique for um, yeah, looking into optically responsive um, charge densities since it combines um, elements of coherent diffraction, so imaging um, electronic densities and uh, spectroscopy. Um, so, uh, potentially, it could be um, a quite um, powerful tool um, in solid state physics to really measure the electronically, um, optically responsive um, charge density. So, we actually get um, a kind of um, imaging technique for valence electrons. It could be used in um, pump probe settings. And um, the big advantage for solid state physics is that it's a momentum resolved measurement, um, such as um, Rick's resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, for instance but uh, we give direct um, probe of the electronic structure. And I mean, since it's a, a quantum optic, um, optical effect, um, I mean, one can generate non-classical states of light. One could um, transfer um, coherence from um, laser um, light um, to um, FEL light, maybe at some point, and um, empl employ methods um, such as um, ghost imaging. Um, so the um, first experimental breakthrough in this um, X-ray optical wave mixing was achieved um, um, back in 2011 by Ernie Glover and collaborators. This was an experiment that performed at the LCLS, Free Electron Laser in Stanford. And um, here you see um, a sketch of the experimental setup of um, this um, some frequency generation process. Um, you would start out um, with um, the FEL, um, that um, emits um, pulses at around 8 kV um, photon energy and um, monochromatizes pulses and overlap them in time on the sample, which was diamond in that case, with an optical laser pulse. And um, by some frequency generation, you would create um, basically an outgoing um, photon in the X-ray domain that um, has a slightly upshifted energy. Um, so phenomenologically, this um, process can be understood um, by, I mean, having this optical laser, this uh, laser dresses um, the um, valence electrons in the systems. Um, so in other words, um, it um, initiates some um, periodic oscillations of the valence electron density. And X-ray that scatter off these um, oscillations 
um, undergo a Doppler shift and are scattered and are emitted um, with a different energy. So this is the, um, the was um, for a long time the theoretical understanding of this process. And um, um, there are tries basically, there have been tries um, um, to basically then uh, reconstruct this um, optically responsive valence electron density. Um, and um, this was explored also, for instance, in the um, VUV um, regime and XUV regime by um, Kenichi Tamasako. Another um, um, effect of um, a parametric X-ray effect is X-ray parametric down conversion. And I will focus uh, my talk on um, this effect today. So the advantage of this effect is that you would not um, need an optical um, laser. Um, but you, you, you would just have an X-ray beam uh, that impinges on your sample and um, you hope for a, a parametric um, spontaneous process to, ha to happen um, that sort of um, scatters an outgoing um, X-ray, produces an outgoing X-ray with a slightly um, reduced energy um, and um, an optical, optical photo. So in order to measure that process, um, you would actually need to measure the outgoing X-ray photon and optical photon in coincidence for really having an unequivocal proof um, of um, this process to happen. Um, instead, I mean, I mean, the problem actually in experiments is that um, you, um, I mean, one creates a lot of um, other processes by um, having X-rays um, interacting with diamond, for instance, um, and um, your um, detectors would actually be swarmed by fluorescence light so that a coincidence measurement of um, an optical photon and an X-ray photon um, is um, very difficult or, yeah, um, yeah, very difficult to actually um, employ in these um, experimental setups. So there are uh, a series of um, experimental demonstrations or at least um, claims of um, experimental demonstrations of this effect that um, come from the group of um, Sharon Schwarz. And um, they focus, I mean, um, by me measuring only the outgoing um, photon in this process and um, underlie the principle of phase matching. So um, by looking at a certain um, direction of the, uh, of the outgoing um, photon um, beam, one actually chooses um, um, a certain idler energy, so a certain energy of the outgoing optical photon. Um, and then um, this process, it is a parametric, parametric coherent process. It um, follows some phase matching conditions, so momentum conservation of this process. And um, in um, this um, set of previous experiments, the outgoing photon flux um, was um, measured. Um, I mean, the, the photon energy of this uh, photon was measured um, by an analyzer and the outgoing uh, photon flux was measured by um, just um, putting a photodiode at um, different points of these phase matching conditions. Um, from the theory side, um, um, the theories or these phenomenological treatments actually date back all to the 70s um, and um, are based on purely semi-classical considerations. So there is a really strong need um, for a novel theory that can actually um, predict, um, qualitatively predict experiments and um, link the actual experimental observables to quantum mechanical properties of the materials. So these uh, first theories, they, um, um, they show this um, phenomenological um, idea of um, optical light inducing charge uh, variations of the valence density, electron density, and um, X-ray light scattering of, um, of this um, oscillating charge and being um, Doppler shifted. So um, we thought it was time for a novel theory. And um, so Dietrich Krebs, a student in my group, he started um, to work on the quantum electrodynamic treatment of this process. Um, so quantum electrodynamically, I mean, we, um, I, I wrote here the interaction hematurion of the system. We treat um, the electronic um, degrees of freedom in the usual way um, by non-relativistic um, Schrodinger equation. And um, the interaction in Hamiltonian in the system is given by the minimal coupling Hamiltonian. And um, here in this community, you typically care about this um, P dot A interaction term um, that's um, relevant for all um, 
interactions with um, visible light or um, UV light. In the X-ray domain, um, the A squared um, term is actually um, becoming important and dominant. And this A squared term um, is the term initiating um, scattering. So um, elastic scattering, crystallography, um, all of these effects are based on this A squared term. As an observable, observable we, um, um, we go for the um, projector, uh, projection operator approach. So um, in the experiment, what we want to observe is um, one scattered photon um, with a, in, within a specific uh, mode of the uh, radiation field. So having a different um, specific moment um, and a specific polarization. And uh, the, the rest of this um, a scattering event is actually remains unobserved in the experiment. And so we have this objection, um, this projection operator and um, the quantum mechanical expectation value of this projection operator that um, is um, just a trace of this operator with um, the um, time dependent um, density matrix of the um, entire system um, then gives you the um, observed um, yield of um, or, um, or rate of observing a photon in this um, scattered mode. So I uh, just want to stress here that um, in the experiments, we are not observing the electronic degrees of freedom and um, the, the visible um, light. So um, actually one uh, needs to um, you know, sum over all the different, I mean, realizations of that. So it's, so one needs to really find, in, in theory, um, ways to find characteristic features that show extra parametric down conversion. So we um, then employ um, perturbative um, expansion, perturbation theory. In, in, in first order perturbation theory, uh, we employ this um, scattering term A squared um, that um, can be, I mean, by not observing the final state, um, the electronic final state, the scattering process can uh, be elastic or inelastic. And in this most general representation, the um, underlying electronic um, quantity that we measure is a density density correlation function. Um, so this um, observable of um, observing scattered photons in mode Ks, um, I mean, links um, to this electron density density correlation function. So that's a typical, typical quantity that um, uh, people care about that um, employ an inelastic X-ray scattering as experiments. And um, the other ingredient um, in, this formal, in this equation is um, the first order correlation function of the X-ray field, all we know. And now the next step in order to um, introduce um, uh, the coupling to the optical field is um, to um, work on this um, electron density, density correlation function and um, address this um, density density correlation function um, by the interaction with the optical field. So we employ second order perturbation theory. And here now we make an important process. In theory, we can actually say we are only looking into um, parametric processes, meaning that um, the electronic degrees of freedom remain unchanged. So initial equals final um, electronic state. And by doing so, I mean, we can reduce the number of um, um, Feynman diagrams are quite considerably in our um, derivation. So um, in parametric processes, only those double-sided um, Feynman diagrams of the density matrix contribute that have, I mean, a, a kind of um, symmetric on, on, both, on, on both legs. So by considering all of these um, different um, Feynman diagrams, then uh, one um, can calculate um, this um, dressed density density correlation function. And um, due to this A to P interaction, one, one actually sees that one gets here a, a new quantity. So this um, new quantity is um, we call P. It's, um, it's a current density density um, correlator. <clears throat> Meaning that um, in this um, kind of um, parametric processes, X-ray optical wave mixing processes, we probe a uh, current density density correlation function of the material. So unlike um, this phenomenological treatment um, that um, um, proposed that uh, one actually could observe um, the, uh, the mere, the mere um, oscillatory um, density of the system or um, this 
optically responsive um, valence electron density, we see that the real object that one um, probes by this process is a current density density correlation function. And um, by putting all the pieces um, together, one can actually get a full um, expression for um, um, the um, yield, the output yield. Um, and um, so I will lead you a little bit um, through these equations, through this equation um, that actually, I mean, here we are now in the, in, in the position to really make quantitative assessments of this um, process. So we have several things here that um, appear. Um, we have um, here the uh, properties of the um, optical field. I mean, here this uh, general expression still allows for actually applying um, optically external laser fields, as would be the case in some frequency generation. For parametric down, down conversion, this term is actually zero. Um, but uh, for the parametric process, we need to treat the quantum fluctuations of the visible field. So this is um, the um, quantum correlation function of the visible field that goes into this uh, final expression. Then we have, um, as in the um, in this usual scattering approach, the correlation function of the um, X-ray radiation field. So that's the um, first order Glauber's correlation function of this um, um, field, X-ray field. And um, um, as already mentioned, the electron current density density correlation function. And if one puts everything together, one actually can um, really, um, yeah, quantitatively predict the experimental outcome of such an experiment. So um, a short um, excurs to what um, theory we used for actually calculating this electron charge density density correlator. For this um, correlation function, uh, we um, employ a simple um, DFT-based approach by um, yeah, interpreting the stated determinant of concharm orbitals as um, as a wave function of the um, of the system, and um, here you see um, in, in solid line you see um, this um, correlation function, and you also see um, the electric func uh, dielectric function that um, kind of um, resembles um, this um, correlation function, but is um, is not um, equivalent to it. So this was done for a spe specific um, scattering plane in diamonds. So here, basically for this um, two to zero um, plane. And then if one puts everything together, one can predict um, signals of X-ray parametric down conversion. So here we suppose a photon energy of the X-ray beam of 11 kV. We uh, want to look into um, the optically created photons of 4.3 um, eV. And um, we map out, um, as we, we were, have been interesting, interested to mapping out the full um, scattering um, um, sphere um, of the scattered radiation. So you have here, um, I mean, in, within um, the typical scattering plane of an extra scattering experiment, you have here the K vector of the incoming um, X-ray beam, um, here the G vector of the, the, the reciprocal um, lattice vector of the um, plane that you reflect from, and um, the phase matching condition um, tells you that um, um, these um, two um, vectors have to sum up to give um, the sum of the outgoing X-ray photon, the scattered X-ray photon, and the optical photon. Um, so here, um, the, the angle theta is the angle between um, incoming and, and scattered photon. Um, that's here on, on the y-axis um, with respect to the usual Bragg angle. You see that um, this um, differs quite um, only, um, that there are small differences um, from the, the Bragg angle of the um, impinging X-ray X -ray source. And um, you actually um, could also, I mean, um, observe um, scattering signals out of plane. Um, so by um, rotating um, these k s k i um, vectors out of this um, of this um, plane of this um, presentation, and the signal that you um, observe um, would um, would be this kind of ellipsoid um, signal and has a characteristic intensity variation on it. That's um, basically determined by by, by theory. Notably, we can also determine um, an absolute um, conversion efficiency um, by, o theory, by o theory, and um, you note that this conversion efficiency is in the range of um, 10 to the minus 15, so um, really 
very small. So an incoming extra photon has the um, yeah, probability of 10 to the minus 15 being converted um, to, I mean, in this extra parametric down conversion process. Notably, um, this conversion efficiency is eight or nine orders of magnitude lower than previously claimed um, in experiments, in a series of experiments. So we're talking about eight or nine orders magnitude um, difference um, in, in, in our theory to the experiments. Um, yeah, <laughs> I have to say that the theory was benchmarked. Um, also, I mean, on the case of some frequency generation and um, there we could um, perfectly um, reproduce um, the experimental results that have been obtained by Ernie Glover and collaborators back in 2012. So, um, one in a typical extra scattering experiment, one does a so-called so um, rocking scan, one then um, moves um, the sample angle towards, um, I mean, the incoming or, I mean, changing the angle between incoming X-ray and the sample surface. Um, that's called a rocking scan curve. And uh, by doing so, the phase uh, matching condition um, changes and also the um, experimental signal uh, will, will change. If one then measures um, in the typical um, um, scattering plane of um, X-ray diffraction setups, um, one can then look into this, um, in the, the created signal that one then wouldn't, that one wouldn't get in, within this um, plane as a function of this um, rocking angle, sample angle. And if one does so, one gets um, the quantity that we then are going to compare to experiments. So here you now have this, um, have this deviation of this um, scattering angle of the scattered photon versus um, the Bragg angle of the fundamental and here the um, sample um, angle. And um, <clears throat> You see that, I mean, by choosing the sample angle, um, I mean, in, in certain positions, one really can enhance um, the signal of the X-ray parametric um, down conversion. So we might actually be in the, um, we can reach um, conversion efficiencies of roughly 10 to the minus 14, five times 10 to the minus um, 14. That would give us, I mean, the count rates, um, the turbidity count rates in an actual experiment. So from the experimental side, I have been collaborating or um, with um, Christina Böhmer. Um, she did her PhD uh, within the group of um, Christian Bresler at the European XFEL and we're collaborating um, together with um, Dietrich Krebs um, since um, roughly one and a half years. And during her PhD she has performed several experiments on extra parametric down conversion in an improved setup um, compared to a um, series of previously um, published experiments. So the setup of the experiments, the following, I mean, you have the incoming X-ray beam, you have um, the, the sample, which is some um, diamond, you have apertures, um, the scattered X-ray beam is um, energy analyzed um, in this sample by, in this example by silicon 440 um, um, crystal. And um, the detector is a pixel detector so that one really can get um, a full image of the um, scattering. Um, yeah plane here. Um, a single scattering picture the detector um, looks like that and then uh, one changes um, the angle um, of the of the diamond's um, surface and one sees that the, um, um, yeah, the picture of this um, de detector image um, changes. If one assembles now um, this 2D map out of this um, 1D pictures by integrating um, over this um, vertical direction one gets this um, 2D um, rocking scan curves and one now um, sees some um, features and strikes and, and flashes and one now has to interpret this um, 2D map um, accordingly. So we can directly now um, see what we compare this to a theory. Um, and um, here these are um, these two maps, um, 2D maps for different um, idler energy settings, ranging from 2 to 2.2 EV to 4.3 EV. And um, this dashed line is the prediction of the theory, um, basically given by um, phase matching, where signal should be, um, should, should be situated. So immediate, you, may, you immediately, immediately see that the signal observed has um, nothing to do with the theory. Um, 
I have to say that in um, previous experiments um, um, that have been um, published in highly ranking journals, um, the, um, the measurement technique was um, to actually choose a um, kind of random um, position on this um, case matching condition and um, counting the number of photons that, that went through. So only um, basically by looking into um, this complete um, 2D scattering map one actually sees that the features that, was, um, that have been interpreted as um, extra parametric down conversions in a series of papers um, might um, actually be only artifacts of measurements. And these um, RF artifacts can actually be um, quantified um, in people working in high resolution X-ray diffraction know this, um, this kind of features. And they are due to um, elastic scattering of um, the full incoming radiation. So one, one does not have only, I mean, um, one has a, a spectrum of um, incoming photons that has a relatively broad bandwidth. And um, the, this, in this high resolution X-ray diffraction um, measurements, one is actually sensitive um, to the tails of the spectral distribution. So here you see um, basically the tails of the spec incoming spectral um, X-rays um, being um, scattered elastically. And the streaks you see here are um, what's called um, monochromator streak, analyzer streak, wavelength streaks, and um, truncation rods. Um, so we launched into um, um, a new experiment um, that um, would um, even um, improve um, the setup. I um, could convince um, my th um, theoretical um, PhD student Dietrich Krebs to actually um, launch into experimental activities um, together with um, Christina. And uh, on board we have, um, in this collaboration, we have Simo Huatari, who is an expert in um, high resolution X-ray diffraction. You see here um, the experimental setup. Um, this is an um, X-ray diffractometer we were using, and these experiments have been uh, conducted at um, beamline P09 at Petra 3 synchrotron. And it was one of the first experiments, as you can see, um, in, um, <laughs> in the corona times. This experiment was done in June. And what we improved in the setup is actually that uh, we did not um, just use the normal um, beamline uh, monochromator. Um, that would give a spectrum shown here in, um, in blue, but um, we um, additionally employed a four bounds um, monochromator stage um, that um, then um, could, I mean, would narrow the incoming spectrum and uh, suppress um, the tails, the spectral tails by several orders of magnitude. And here you see um, um, a Bragg peak, a picture of the Bragg peak in high resolution um, zoomed in for the old setup where you see um, these typical um, streaks, um, um, this monochromator and um, trunc crystal truncation rod streaks. And in this new setup, um, we are zooming in here now um, in this um, special region around um, the Bragg peak where we um, then actually su um, suppose signal. And um, you see that we could clear up all these um, instrumental artifacts um, quite a bit. So we have only this feature left. And this feature is um, the trun uh, crystal truncation rod, uh, which is, um, um, is the elastic scattering um, of the surface of the um, diamond crystal. So um, with this uh, really, really improved setting, we also had an um, um, additional um, analyzer um, a crystal um, installed to even have a better energy resolution of the outcoming um, experiment, we actually were hunting for the X-ray parametric down conversion signal and could not find any signal. So uh, we perfectly measured zero. We could, <laughs> we have really now, I mean, we um, um, put in a lot of shielding and um, I mean, did this very, very careful um, characterization of the instrumental function. The signal should be around here and around this um, right ellipse. Here you see the remainder of the um, break scattering of um, the tails of um, the in incoming um, X-ray X -ray pulse, but um, no um, signal determined. We need to determine uh, now the upper bound of the conversion efficiency um, um, to the signal. I didn't mention that in uh, Christina's previous um, experiments, uh, she could determine uh, the, um, an upper bound for this conversion efficiency of 10 to the minus 11. So most likely um, this conversion efficiency is um, 
is going to come out um, even lower than the 10 to minus 11 and we're approaching the theoretical value. So to conclude, I have um, told you about um, the story of um, X-ray parametric down conversion and X-ray optical wave mixing effects. Um, in these effects, in these parametric effects, uh, we actually uh, measure the current density, density correlation function of um, systems. Um, we have uh, developed a theory based on non-relativistic quantum electrodynamics that um, can predict char characteristic geometric features uh, for clear experimental evidence uh, of this effect. We uh, predict uh, extremely low conversion efficiencies um, in the range of um, 10 to the minus 14 or below that per incoming photon. And our theory shows good qualitative agreement um, with experiments of some frequency generation. Um, in our exper experimental campaigns, um, I mean, you see, you really see you need a really um, high resolution extra scattering setup. And um, with improved experiments, um, we could not observe um, signatures of X-ray parametric down conversion. Um, and um, um, we um, basically, I would state that um, previously published experiments that have been interpreted as X-ray parametric down on conversion signals are uh, mere artifacts of the measurements. So these were uh, measurements of the instrumental function. And we determined um, the upper bound of a conversion efficiency experimentally, but um, to be um, 10 to the minus 11 per incoming volume. As an outlook, uh, we have um, a new experimental campaigns planned on extra parametric down conversion to hunt for the signal and um, some frequency generation. And on the theory side, uh, we actually um, want to calculate this uh, material response functions for a larger variety of uh, materials, crystals, um, um, systems with um, collective excitations, um, such as plasmons and materials with higher degree of electron correlation to actually see if this um, technique can be um, a yeah, valuable technique in studying um, um, material, I mean, solid state physics, and um, interesting materials. And on that topic, we have a current uh, postdoc um, opening in theory. And if you know of interested students or are yourself interested, um, you can um, yeah, write me an email. Thank you for your, your attention. Thank you, Nina, for sharing this, uh, all these new results. So now it's time for question. So you can ask questions using the live question and answers panel. So there is one question from Eva. So thank you for the great talk, very interesting results. Can you estimate how large the, the error is when using DFT for two particle correlation quantity? Yeah, I mean, we have not, I mean, <laughs> this is a uh, completely different um, question, so. <laughs> So uh, it's clear that, I mean, uh, we employed um, DFT um, for um, calculating the dielectric response and this um, density and current density um, function um, of, um, of diamond. I mean, for these um, newly planned projects, we have to go beyond um, DFT um, <laughs> calculations. Um, so um, we are planning there actually um, to go in the direction of beta sub beta equations or really um, having yeah, I mean, we really have to ramp up um, <laughs> our theoretical efforts in that direction. So this, um, yeah, needs to be explored. Thank you. Is there any other question for, for Nina? No. That's a topic which is a little bit out of the scope of the conference, I fear. <laughs> Yeah, but on the other end, it's very nice to see the, the connections that we, we might have. So when you, you were talking about uh, other materials, looking at uh, systems with more correlation, do you have specific ideas in mind? Well, I mean, for, I mean, for experiments, one, one needs to say that one needs really um, um, perfect crystals. <laughs> so the, um, they also, I mean, one of the imp um, improvement in the experiment was also the replacing the diamond by really a, um, one of the best diamonds we got from, from a collaborator from Argonne National Laboratory. Um, so that's, that sort of limits the systems. I mean, the next system we want to look into is uh, silicon. Um, and um, I mean, Sharon Schwarz um, has uh, measured a series of um, materials that we would like to, I mean, 
calculate um, and then um, yeah, go from there. Um, the other idea is to, um, looking, to look into um, model Hamiltonians. Um, that would also be a nice approach. Um, a model Hamiltonians where one um, really could, um, um, ex I mean, more at least um, yeah, close to exactly calculate um, these uh, response functions and then see if um, this technique at all would be responsive to electron correlation before we would launch into, I don't know, the emerge calculations of <laughs> these functions. So. Yeah, so that, that's a quite involved um, project on um, electronic structure calculations. Okay, thank you, Nina. Is there any other question? Seems not. So thank you again, Nina, for the very thank nice you. presentation. So now I would like to remind you that uh, you can actually discuss with each speaker. There are specific rooms for that on the website. So it's called Meet the Speakers. And uh, also after the break, uh, there will be two uh, parallel sessions uh, corresponding to the working group one and working group two of the cost action. So, and with that, I would like to thank the speakers and all the participants and I hope.